Hello, everybody, and thank you for sticking with me throughout this whole semester. If you've made it this far, today we're going to talk about what happens when kinship fails or seems to fail as a system. But to refresh, last time we talked about Solon's kind of optimistic solution to the problem of kinship by formulating all kinship as mutuality of being. And by formulating kinship as mutuality of being, kinship remains a specific domain of human social life with unique structure that's about the unique connection of sharing your existence in some essential way with other people. So look at that. Yay, we did it. We fixed it. We solved the problems of the whole semester. Except what happens when kinship fails or seems to vanish as an organizing principle of society or people's lives? One of the things that I've repeated a lot throughout this semester is that functionalist arguments are generally bad arguments. So in a world where kinship seems not to be an organizing principle, we might ask, how can the functions of kin be fulfilled in a post-kinship world? But we might also want to ask, is there even such a thing as a post-kinship world? So the author of today's article, Shinsuke Nozawa, starts with describing a social problem. And anthropologists don't usually like to call things social problems. That seems really judgmental. But this is identified as a social problem locally in Japan. And that problem is kodokushi, or solitary death. Specifically, kodokushi is the fate of elderly people in urban or suburban Japan. And Nozawa tells us that this stereotypically happens when old people living alone, detached from kin and neighbors, die alone without being noticed immediately, leaving the body to decompose. This is more associated with men and specifically men or other elderly people in general who are divorced, retired, or generally detached from neighbors. So you might very well reasonably ask what went wrong such that the idea of dying alone and unnoticed is a kind of normal problem that people know about and think about watching out for? And the answer is a lot of things. Um, Nozawa's term is that there is just a diffuse sense of crisis. The air is full of anxiety and brokenness. Some of the problem is demographic. For decades, birth rates in Japan have been below the replacement rate, which is roughly um, two people per couple. That makes sense, right? There are two people, you give birth to two new people, and then you've taken care of that. Um, when you die, uh, they will still be there to carry on in society for you. And the low birth rate is a whole other social problem and very much part of what I research. But basically, because Older people are living longer. Um, Japan's life expectancy is some of the longest in the world, but more young people aren't being born. Elderly people have a reduced support network. In a alternate universe with a higher birth rate, there would maybe be lots of young people to do elder care, to spend time with elderly people, but they don't exist in this universe. At the same time that elderly people 
are experiencing the the threat or perhaps vulnerability for kodokushi and a lack of a support network we also see that there is a longing for connection there is a kind of fraud in japan called ore ore sagi uh it's me it's me fraud wherein a scam artist calls up an elderly person pretends to be a younger relative and says that he's in trouble and he needs money and could you please send money to this bank account this scam is so common that japanese atms all have warnings on them that you know say like are you sure you know the person that you're sending this money to because um usually you would go to the atm to do this transaction so nozawa tells us that like a computer hacker the scam artist who does the ore ore sagi scans the kinship system for its security holes moments of indifference where this is a person that is experiencing a lot of indifference from society a person that a lot of other people maybe don't care about and it fills up that moment of indifference with interest manufacturing a need for contact and a purpose an end one thing that came out of his previous research which was with life narratives with older people in japan was the lots of the people that he interviewed made suggestions that like he needed to be careful about how he approached their houses because there's this beautiful quote right how rare it is nowadays to see a young man visiting old persons at home to hear their stories on the one hand it's really nice and a lot of people wanting to tell him their stories on the other hand like oh my god what is this guy doing is he going to rob the old people <laughs> so his previous fieldwork experience highlights both the value and the danger of contact that there is longing for it that allows many older people to be tricked by this particular kind of fraud but also suspicion nozawa wraps this up in what he calls the fantasy of the phatic phatic being language oriented towards making connections kodokushi signals a limit case of kinship as a default model of sociality it incites people's fantastic imagination about what chronotope of sociality might be possible when kinship fails or better in fact precisely my point when kinship isn't interesting so in trying to wrestle with the social problem that nozawa presents us with we can ask first of all what does it mean to be in touch with someone or by contrast to be without connections that might be a support network but by contrast might actually be burdening you and potentially other people Again, as I mentioned before, the phatic function of language is the function that enables contact with other people, that creates and maintains a channel through which communication can flow. So the word hello doesn't really have a meaning. Its meaning is, hello, I would like to talk to you. That's it. That's all it means. So the antidote to a society of no relation is what is called phatic labor. That is labor meant to build up those channels of communication through making regular contact and establishing communicative relationships. So one program that Nozawa discusses is Furea Yubin or Touching Together Mail or scheduled neighborhood events to meet the neighbors and make sure that you know who your neighbors are that you have a relationship with them if you didn't before and prioritizing greetings as speech encouraging people to say hello to everyone they meet which is really not a very japanese thing the word for a lack of connection that nozawa uses is muen 
And he translates N as ineffable connection, not just a connection, but a connection that maybe you can't explain that feels karmic or magical or destined somehow. Many kinds of N have been lost, like regional N or blood N or social ties that Nozawa calls institutionalizable N. The term N is connected to practical relations of care and ritual moments of kinship. So one of my favorite words in Japanese is N musubi, which literally means tying your N together. And that's marriage. You are sort of tying your connections together permanently. You are integrating with each other. It's also connected to the Buddhist concepts of karma and reincarnation, as I mentioned, so that connections can appear in the present as a predetermined result of past actions and relationships. You can say en ga aru, like there is en, or en ga nai, there isn't en, or nani kano en, some kind of en, related somehow. Who knows? I don't know. It's magical. I can't explain it, but somehow there's a connection here. So Nozawa tells us the institutional N invokes calculative reason, a business of sociopolitical institutionality, whereas ineffable N induces speculative pleasure, a wager on the maze of social life. So he presents us with two possibilities for envisioning connectedness. We have institutions with known structures, or we have this vision of magical encounters. And as a solution to these identified problems, which do we want to encourage in post-kinship Japan? I want to end on a hopeful note, and I think Nozawa wants to end on a hopeful note too. He writes, if disconnection affords freedom, because connections can be burdens, and resignation works as a tactic of life, even only momentarily, then the phatic mereness, a fantasy of pointy life, might invite people to experiment with new forms of co-presence with others, a new practical politics of togetherness. A fuller co-presence may be just a dream, a hoax. People will still die alone, but a reckoning of alterity might allow them to live and die believing their life and death will be notable to somebody, a you, any one of you, on the other side of the channel. I know you are not here. I just want a hint, a sign that you are alive and waiting for me. Not even that. When Nozawa talks about the fantasy of pointy life, he is talking about a life not necessarily structured by a fixed sense of connection and duty and bonds, but rather a life that is punctuated by moments of magical encounter and connection that maybe you can't even explain. And the fantasy of pointy life reminds me, at least, of Collier and her co-authors note that when we recognize the constructed and historical nature of kinship, we can consider what kinds of bonds we want. So Japan's current state of loss and what seems to be a decay of kinship bonds is possibly also a productive place where people can become creative about finding meaning in their connections with other people. Thank you so much for being with me all semester. And although we haven't been able to connect in person, I hope that you have had pointy moments where you feel that we really have come together.